Hi, everyone. Welcome to this seminar series. And I am glad that you joined us for today's presentation. Today, we will listen to Charles Gauthier talking about optimizing classic soil carbon parameters using Bayesian optimization and observational data sets. And uh, thank you so much, Charles, for accepting to present your research here. Charles completed his undergraduate studies in physics at University de Montréal. He is now pursuing his MSc under the supervision of Dr. Oliver Zonentak and Dr. Joe Melton. Uh, his research aims to reduce uncertainty in predicted soil carbon dynamics using the Canadian Land Surface Scheme, including biogeochemical cycles model known as CLASSIC. Uh, being a process-based model, CLASSIC relies on several parameters, parameter values that cannot be obtained from observations. Uh, the goal of uh, Charles' research is to use Bayesian techniques as well as multiple data schemes in order to find the optimal parameter values to reduce uncertainty in simulated soil car carbon dynamics. And thank you again, Charles, for presenting your work. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this introduction. Um, yeah, it uh, feels uh, special to be on this side of the presentation for once. Uh, I used to be uh, organizing this seminar. Um, all right. Uh, I've realized now that my title slide doesn't match uh, the title of the presentation, but it's mostly the same thing. Uh, yeah, I'll be talking today about my research, uh, which mainly is about optimizing the soil carbon parameters of uh, CLASSIC, which is the model that's developed by Environment and Ch Climate Change Canada. Uh, and I'm using Bayesian optimization to do it, as well as uh, some data sets. Uh, my goal today uh, is to go over all of this, but keep it as, at a um, good level for everyone to uh, have a good understanding of it, because I know not all of us are doing modeling, and so I'm trying to uh, make that as accessible as I can. All right. Um, so. The, oh, I need to click on this. All right. So the objectives uh, of my master was mainly uh, as a main objective was to improve classics prediction of soil organic carbon content and fluxes. Uh, so soil organic carbon is, as you all know, uh, important. It's an important pool or part of the global carbon cycle. Uh, it contains a lot of carbon, but also bit, uh, with everything happening with climate change, it has the potential to become uh, part of a uh, soil and climate carbon feedback. Uh, also because of uh, thawing permafrost, for example. So all the carbon that's contained in the soil uh, or in the permafrost that thaws gets, uh, again, released in the atmosphere and so therefore starts a feedback. And so it's very important for us to understand uh, how the soil will answer to uh, changing climate and how how much uh, that feedback could be. Uh, and it's a very difficult thing to do uh, because all of the parameters that we need uh, for modeling soil are not parameters that are easy uh, to measure. So not parameters that you could easily just go outside and measure. Um, and so we have to rely on other methods, uh, for example, uh, Bayesian optimization, which is what I'm doing. Uh, so that's the main goal here to improve the predictions. Um, but more specifically, uh, one of my objectives uh, was to first identify uh, sensitive parameters or maybe more parameters that contributed uh, to the sensitivity of the mod model outputs. And I'll go back on this in a few slides. And then after we identified the parameters, uh, another objective was to create this Bayesian optimization framework that we would then use to uh, optimize parameters. And finally, once we had the framework, framework uh, the goal was to optimize the parameter, obtain the posterior uh, parameter distributions, and uh, yeah, figure out what, uh, what that means uh, once we have the, the results. Uh, so a bit about the model that I'm using. So this is uh, classic. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, process pro processes in it. Uh, so you can see that it simulates water, energy, as well as some uh, carbon uh, cycle or processes such as CO2 and methane. And it's a very complex model. There's a lot that goes into it, uh, maybe a bit too much for just a master project. And so my part 
uh, in this uh, is really what's in this box here, uh, which is mainly the soil carbon module of classic, which also includes the heterotrophic respiration uh, of the soil that you can see here with this arrow. So heterotrophic respiration is the flux of carbon that comes out of the soil once the organic matter in the soil decomposes and gets released uh, in the form of CO2 to the atmosphere. So even though this is a complicated model, you can see it in a very, uh, say, simple way. There's two pools uh, in the model. So one that we could call the litter, which includes all the, the carbon input that comes from litter. So that is litter from fallen leaves, uh, stems, but also carbon that's inputted into soil uh, by the root system. And then uh, we have another pool here, which represents uh, the slower carbon, so carbon that gets uh, maybe deeper in soil and stays there for longer. So you can see that carbon enters uh, our section of the model through a carbon input in the litter pool, and then the litter pool transfers uh, to, to the soil pool via this uh, humification process, and both pools are respiring CO2. So here in this uh, little uh, picture here, the arrows mainly could, uh, to give you an example, are, uh, yeah, are uh, have a parameter value associated to them. So you have a parameter that's the uh, humification transfer, uh, which is a number that tells us how much of the litter pool gets transferred into the soil pool per unit of time. Same thing goes with the, what we call the base uh, respiration rates, which is how much carbon is exiting both pools. So there's a few uh, arrows here. So we might uh, think that there's not a lot of parameters, but once we uh, analyze the model, uh, it came up to uh, 40 parameters. And that is because uh, in this model, there's uh, multiple plant functional types, uh, so types of plant that are simulated, and each type has uh, a parameter value, say, of a ba base respiration rates. And as well as the, the respiration and the humification transfer, there's also a lot of parameters that are related to the environment. And so, uh, for example, temperature parameters, moisture parameters, but also some uh, depth uh, parameters because uh, the model reduces the amount of carbon that exits uh, the deeper you go in the soil column. And so once we had all of our parameter. So here's a, uh, a table. There's a lot going on here, but mainly uh, the main message here is that there's a lot of parameters. So 40 parameters to optimize, uh, yeah, becomes a, a big number. And maybe when looking at all these parameters, uh, we started wondering uh, what parameters are important uh, in our case in simulating the soil organic con uh, carbon content of soils. And, and the fluxes, uh, because maybe some of these parameters do not play an important role in uh, those model outputs. And so if the parameter is not uh, influencing the outputs, then it's going to be, for first thing, it's going to be hard to optimize because it's not going to answer to our optimization very well. And so in order to identify which of these parameters we should keep in our optimization framework, and which of these we should remove. So parameters that are not contributing to the, uh, or influencing the outputs. We uh, went and performed a uh, sensitivity analysis. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that, uh, maybe going on three different topics uh, about the sensitivity analysis that we did. So the first thing being that it is uh, what is called a Sobel method, which is variance based. Um, and we used a gradient of sites uh, to, do the analysis, and we also use multiple outputs to get a better picture. And I'll go over all of these. Uh, so for the Sobel sensitivity analysis, what it produces is uh, what we call sensitivity index, which is a quantity that helps you, um, tells you how much of uh, the variance of the model is due to one of the parameters. And so what that means is basically, um, if you change the value of the parameter and you play with it a bit, how much does it change the value of your output? Uh, if you do a little change on your parameter value and it has a huge impact on your output, then you can see that uh, the model model's output is very sensitive to that parameter. 
And so the Sobol uh, method is variance-based, as I mentioned. It uses the variance of the model to compute uh, those two sensitivity index. So the first one being the first order index and the total index. And I'll go in a bit more details uh, of those in just a few moments. It's also a method that we picked uh, because it has a low computational cost. And also it doesn't really um, interact with the model much. Uh, what it needs to, what you need to to have to perform this analysis is just really input output, and so that made it very easy to implement. And it's also been used in similar efforts, and so it was a good indication that uh, it was a method that would be helpful for us. Um, so for the things that it produces, uh, the first order index and the total uh, sensitivity index. So the first order index. Um, you can boil it down to really how much the parameter influences the output. That's your first order index. That's what it tells you. And the total sensitivity index uh, tells you how much the parameter, uh, how much the parameter's interaction with other parameters influences the output. And so it gives you a, a more of a sense of like as a general thing when you look at all your parameters. Um, together, how much this one is uh, responsible for the, the variation of your output. And so um, once we identified our technique, uh, we wanted to then uh, decide how we would be doing the analysis. Uh, and so instead of doing the analysis uh, and using model runs that simulated uh, global soil organic carbon content, uh, which would have been very computationally expensive, we decided to use a gradient of sites. And now I'm seeing now that uh, you can see, but there's another site here, which is hidden by the border of my screen. Uh, let me see if I can just, yeah, right over here. And so we used uh, three sites, uh, three flux tower uh, sites. So one in Canada, which is Trail Valley Creek, one in Finland, and one in Ghana. And what that did is that it offered us uh, the different characteristics climate characteristics uh, that are represented in the model because we wanted a range of uh, climate conditions to be sure that all of our parameters would be used. Uh, for example, if you have a parameter that's related to uh, freezing soils, for example, well, if you only simulate uh, sites that are in the desert, well, you won't be using that parameter and therefore it won't be, sens it, it won't be showing uh, any sensitivity, let's say. And so, um, let me just go back to full screen. There you go. So here's a table uh, of all the sites with maybe a bit more details. Um, so the three things I want to draw your attention to uh, is the mean annual temperature. So you can see that there's a nice gradient here from Trail Valley Creek to the Finland site to the Gaina site. Uh, same thing for precipitation, uh, which for us, uh, mo modeling soil carbon means moisture. And so different uh, ranges of moisture, as well as some different permafrost extent. And so in Trail Lake Week, it's a continuous permafrost site, but there's no permafrost in uh, the other two sites. So that uh, made sure that we had uh, permafrost in our analysis. And so that our parameters that are related to freezing soils, for example, uh, turbation, uh, which is the process by which the carbon moves up and down your soil column. Well, by having this site, we, would, we made sure that uh, that parameter would be involved. And then um, we also decided to use uh, multiple outputs. It's two outputs mainly. Um, so the reason why we do this, uh, first of all, when we further down the road did uh, our optimization, we compared the model to two different data sets. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. But there were uh, comparison made with soil organic content as well as some um, respiration flux estimates. And so we wanted to, uh, in our sensitivity analysis, do the analysis on the same type of outputs that we would be using in our uh, optimization framework. And the reason why we used uh, different um, outputs um, is that, for example, if you have a vector of parameter, and so you can see these as the, the parameters that go into your model, <clears throat> well, then maybe that your first parameter will be uh, can, will be uh, having an impact of your on your output one, which could be soil organic content, but it won't change um, the simulated heterotrophic respiration flux. 
and maybe that your second parameter is going to be the opposite. And so by doing uh, by using multiple outputs, we ensure that we're not missing on parameters that <clears throat> only affect one output and not the other. Um, yeah. And so uh, now moving on to some of the results that we gained from this analysis. And let me just have a quick sip of water. So we have, we've uh, observed some different um, behaviors in our analysis. So uh, first thing, maybe uh, here's the figure that shows the, the ranking of the parameter according to their um, sensitivity index. So in red is the total sensi sensitivity index. And in blue is the first order sensitivity index. And those are the parameters <coughs> ranked uh, based on that. And so you can see that uh, one thing that we saw, first of all, is that if you, we looked at different outputs, we would get different ratings. Uh, and so see for this one, looking at uh, soil organic carbon stock, which is uh, the amount of carbon in soils, you can see that uh, it's pretty much always the same three parameters that come out uh, as the contributing the most to the, the model's output. If you move on to heterotrophic respiration flux, you can see that this ranking, the same three parameters change uh, across the three sites. And the, the ranking doesn't remain the same. And so what that tells us is that <clears throat> uh, it's a good thing that we looked at both uh, outputs because uh, we would have missed maybe some of the parameters uh, because of the ranking changing. Um, another behavior that we saw was difference across the sites. Uh, so for example, this parameter dB, which is a uh, related to turbation, you can see that it is uh, sensitive or contributing to the change in the output at the CATVC site, so the one with permafrost, but it is not contributing in the other two sites. And so this is also a good indication that uh, it's a good thing that we did our gradient of sites. Otherwise, if we didn't include this site, we would have missed uh, this parameter and maybe we would have uh, labeled it as not sensitive and removed it from the optimization. And then another thing that we saw uh, was no uh, sensitivity, uh, no matter if we looked at different sites or different output. You can see, for example, if I go back and forth between our two outputs, uh, you can see that this K-term parameter here um, doesn't uh, show any sensitivity in any cases, which is uh, the goal of this uh, analysis was to ident identify those types of parameters because these are easy to uh, to say, well, you're not uh, contributing to the output or you're not influencing the output, then why should we bother optimizing this parameter if it's not going to um, react to being optimized, let's say. And so from all of this, uh, looking at our uh, analysis, we uh, came up with four different optimization scenarios uh, with an increasing amount of parameter. Uh, and without going maybe in too much details, uh, here between this scenario and the second one, uh, I know that it's a big jump between four and 22. The reason is uh, for this first scenario, instead of using uh, for some of the parameter that had uh, one parameter value per plant uh, functional types, we only used one value for all plant functional types um, just to see what difference it would make. And so from there, we had um, the parameters that we wanted to use in the optimization. And we had also removed the parameters uh, that we knew were not going to contribute to the, the, the model's output. And so from there, uh, we started to uh, optimize the parameter. And now I've been talking about optimization a lot. And I know sometimes it might uh, not be something that everyone's familiar with. And so I'm just going to walk you through the framework. Uh, and maybe after that, just explain some of the components uh, so that we all have a clear idea of uh, what was going on. So I mentioned that we selected our parameters, and that's really where the optimization starts. So we, we take our selected parameters that we then give to a Bayesian algorithm. And what the Bayesian algorithm does, it, it selects a set of parameters uh, to try. And then what it does, it, it feeds those parameters to our soil carbon model. Um, and then what we do is that we take this model, we simulate the soil organic carbon content, as well as the uh, respiration flux. And after that, uh, and I see now that, yeah, it's a bit cropped here, but you should still be able to read. Um, 
So after that, once we've simulated our outputs, uh, we compare them to the observation data sets. So, uh, and the comparison happens through a loss function, uh, which once you run that to the loss function, you end up with a score. And that score, what it does, it's, it's, um, it gives you an idea of how well the model is doing at replicating the observations. And once we have the score, we run it through a criteria, which is basically just saying, is the score good enough? Or has this been going on long enough? And if the answer is yes, uh, well, then we have our optimized parameter value. If the answer is no, we go back to the algorithm, uh, which then picks a new set of parameters, and then the cycle starts anew. Uh, of course, that's not all done by hand. It's all uh, automated, and we do this a lots, lots of times. And in the hope that uh, at the end we get uh, good optimized values. And so now moving on to some of the components in this framework uh, in a bit more details. So I've mentioned that we were using different types of data sets. Uh, so we used two data sets, the World Soil Information Service, so WOSIS, we used for the bulk uh, soil carbon data sets. So WOSIS contains a lot of soil profiles uh, that are not modeled, it's all uh, measured uh, or site level or point data uh, that we used then uh, to do our comparison with the model. And we also used the soil race creation database, uh, which is uh, chamber estimates of yearly uh, respiration flux. And so what we did uh, when I show you over here, uh, our simulated outputs, uh, we simulated the, both uh, those quantity to then compare to both data sets. And what using um, different data sets allows us to do is um, hopefully better constrain our parameters. Uh, a bit like in the sensitivity analysis when we were using uh, two different outputs, maybe that uh, some of the parameters will uh, better be optimized when looking at soil carbon, or maybe it's going to be uh, soil respiration. And so by using the two data sets, we hope that it would uh, lead into a better, uh, better constrained parameter uh, distributions in the end. I've also mentioned the loss functions. Um, so we used two different loss function. And the reason is that, uh, or maybe I'll just describe them first. So the first one is what we called the error oriented one. And we also have a mean oriented one. And so what they do, the, the error oriented one, the loss function, it uh, pushes the model to be within observational error, and the mean-oriented loss function uh, pushes the model to reproduce exactly the observed uh, value. And the difference between the two here, uh, and the reason why <clears throat> we decided to use two uh, loss functions, is that we wanted to see um, what difference it made if we really took the time to take into consideration that uh, the data sets have error uh, also. And so, um, instead of just saying to the model, you need to replicate exactly what is observed, we, with the error-oriented uh, loss function, we, we said to the model, well, okay, if you simulate it close enough that you're within uh, the error of the observation, then we'll give you a good score. We'll consider it like it's, it's, it's a good uh, run that you have. And then, uh, yeah, that's why we used both of them. So we wanted to see what difference it made. And the algorithm that we used uh, is a tree of bars and estimator algorithm from the HyperUp library. Uh, it is a sequential model-based optimization uh, algorithm, which is a Bayesian formalization. So for those of you that are maybe not uh, as much familiar with all of this, um, what it does basically <coughs> uh, with Bayesian optimization is that the algorithm uses uh, previous attempts to learn and better inform itself to, uh, in its selection of the, the new parameters to try. So every time it does uh, one cycle through the uh, optimization framework that I showed, it uses all the tries that it has done before and then tries to make uh, a better choice of the parameters to try based on that. The reason why uh, we use this uh, algorithm uh, amongst other reasons is it's an algorithm that's mostly used in hyperparameter optimization in um, machine learning frameworks. But in our cases, uh, the, the search phase in which our algorithm evolves is very similar to those problems. That is, 
there's a lot of uh, local minima. There's a lot of uh, equifinality. That is that uh, many different sets of parameter can give you the good answer. And so it's really hard to tell uh, which parameter sets is, is, is the good one. And so that's why we use this algorithm um, in our framework. And then maybe just a bit more on uh, the difference between, well, I call this standard here, but really uh, optimization in itself is a discipline. And so there's lots of different types of optimization out there, but the difference maybe with Bayesian optimization is that Whereas with other methods, you might start with uh, just initial parameter values. So you say, all right, these are my default parameters, uh, optimize them. And then what you get in return is just optimize parameter values. So they're just the numbers uh, that yielded the best uh, results. When we use Bayesian optimization, we use parameter distribution. And so we say, for example, for one parameter, we say, all right, um, right now I know that my parameter value that I use is somewhere around here, but I'm not too confident about it. So let's give it like this uh, probability distribution just to you know, uh, say that, yeah, I have this default value, but uh, I'm not too confident in it. And once you optimize it, the hope is uh, that you get a narrower parameter distribution. And so maybe it's, it's, it, it will have shifted towards another value. And you can see in this very simple example here that it's it's, more constrained. And that's what I mean by more constrained is that you can see that it's centered more narrow around a certain value. And so you have more confidence in the value than if it's uh, more constrained. So it gives you not only just the value that you have optimized, but also a sense of how well optimized uh, it has been. And so that's also why we picked uh, Bayesian optimization. So now for some results, uh, I've been running this optimization with getting some results. And now we're uh, at the stage of trying to uh, put all this uh, together and, and draw some conclusions. I wanted to uh, give you some examples of the results. Um, so here is a distribution of parameters after we've optimized them. So what you're seeing here, uh, obviously is there's one parameter per vertical violent plot here. And uh, the y-axis here is just a normalized range uh, centered around the default value. So how you can interpret this is that uh, in the beginning, the value of the parameter was at the gray dotted line. And then here is the distribution that we got from running our optimization. And we all, I also plotted the best value. So the value that yielded the best score. Um, so you can see in this quick figure, the, this is for uh, environmental parameters. So the turbation parameter I mentioned before, some temperature parameters, uh, another one related to temperature as well as moisture. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that for some parameter, for example, this QD parameter here, uh, you can see that the distribution is less, <coughs> less constrained maybe than some other parameters like maybe this uh, QC here or uh, this parameter, turbation parameter here. So we've obtained uh, those parameters distributions for every scenario that I mentioned before. So with different amount of parameters, as well as for every uh, loss function. Um, and once you take all of these best uh, parameter values, uh, I've took them and put them all in the same figure. And now I know this is a busy figure, but just stick with me. Um, so what this shows is for every parameter that we had in our framework, on the same range of zero to one, this normalized range of uh, the initial value, you can see that for the, well, here it's only the first uh, three scenarios, but you can see that <clears throat> it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit all over the place. So in the ideal world, what we would have seen is cases like maybe this one here, where for one parameter, all your scenarios and loss function go towards just almost the same uh, value. Uh, but it's not the case. Uh, and so what that tells us is that there's still a lot of uh, equifinality in this, meaning that uh, many different parameter sets will yield the same uh, simulated value. And so uh, it's a hard thing to overcome. But at the same time, um, we uh, optimize on a plus or minus 20% range of the initial parameter value. And so maybe one way would be to explore further uh, than this 20% range and see then if 
maybe uh, we see a convergence of um, the parameter values across all our scenario and loss functions. Um, so after that, what we did uh, was to take these values, so take these um, best optimized parameter values, and we tried them with the model to see, all right, there's a lot of uh, difference in here, but what does it really mean when we simulate uh, soil carbon? And so we did uh, some runs using the um, using only the soil organic carbon uh, module. And so this is just uh, simulating the global soil organic content uh, through 1900 through uh, 2020. So <clears throat> here's the no total number of uh, petagrams. One thing to note is that <coughs> our module does not include uh, peatlands or uh, other processes that are included in the model, but not in the module. And so uh, this estimates may differ from uh, what's normally simulated. But here, we just wanted to compare uh, across our different optimization runs. So here in black, you have um, the default value. So that is what the model is simulating using the parameters as they are right now. And uh, the other colored lines are our uh, best parameter values. So you can see that apart from this uh, scenario here, SP, um, which I think I've mislabeled before, but it's the first one with the less amount of parameters, uh, you can see that it yields lower uh, global soil organic content. But other than that, you can see that our other runs, they seem to all be around uh, our default value. One thing that's interesting is that you can see that there's a lot of difference. Uh, so the same color corresponds to the same scenario, but different uh, loss functions. So you can see that using a different loss function, so a different way to, to evaluate your model against observation, uh, makes a difference in the simulated uh, soil organic carbon content. And so that raises some interesting uh, methodological questions. Uh, because to my knowledge, I, I know it's not a thing that's often discussed is what loss function we should take. Uh, and uh, often not, it's not uh, compared to other. And so it's very interesting, interesting to see that the way that you compare your model uh, influences uh, your optimization to a point where um, you'll simulate uh, very different uh, soil organic carbon content. And I'll, as well as a... Uh, like total global uh, carbon simulation. We also did some spatial simulated distributions. Um, so here is our simulated uh, soil organic carbon content for one of our runs. And here it is compared to this uh, harmonized world soil data set. Uh, so basically right now as it is, uh, it looks like we're underestimating carbon uh, when we compare to data sets. Um, so you can see it that yeah, it's generally lower. And if you look also at uh, soil grid data set, you can see that we're very uh, underestimating carbon in higher latitudes, uh, which is obviously an issue. Um, so we're trying to make sense of all of this um, and understand why our yielded uh, parameter values, yeah, are optimizing uh, less carbon than what's observed. Um, so maybe just to recap all of this. Um, so why? Uh, are we looking into soil carbon? Well, our goal is to uh, achieve a better understanding of soil carbon dynamics and improve the, the model's predictions. Um, how are we doing it? Well, we're optimizing the parameters using a Bayesian optimization framework and as well as some uh, different data sets. And what we get out of it is optimized soil carbon parameters and hopefully better predictions. But as you can see, uh, there's still a lot going on, uh, a lot of interesting things and challenges happening. And so we're still uh, trying to make sense of all of this. Uh, and so that's, uh, that concludes the part on the, my research project. Uh, I wanted to do just to take a bit of time also to maybe go over, since I'm at the end of my master, um, go over all the opportunities I had uh, through either this network or just my master's in general, because uh, I feel like maybe some other HQP uh, could just, yeah, see this and say, hey, uh, it looks nice. Maybe I can also uh, try some of those opportunities. So this is my segment called Tales from a Master Thesis. Uh, it's, it's short and sweet. Um, so I, yeah, I listed uh, a, a bit of everything I did. It, I did this uh, fairly quickly. So 
as a recap, yeah, I went to two AGMs. Unfortunately, not this one uh, this year, which was in person, but I went to two of those uh, the past two years. I've did some posters, EDI workshops, which were great. I had the chance to do a training course with uh, Colorado uh, or Arizona uh, in Arizona virtually. Um, yeah. I also had the chance to be a mentor for a program here uh, with some high schools. I went to many conferences, again, online, um, lots of Zoom calls, uh, just like this one today. And um, yeah, I've also participated in Pitch and Polish, where I uh, had the chance to write a blog article for Science Borealis, uh, which you, you can see here. That's a very, I found it to be a very great opportunity. And so I encourage uh, all the HQP here that didn't uh, participate yet to participate. It's been a very great experience for me. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, early in the present or before the presentation, rather, uh, I also got the chance to go in the field, which is uh, for someone doing modeling on the computer. Uh, it's a very good opportunity. Um, and so here's a few pictures of my um, ventures in the north. Uh, I went to the Northwest Territories. Uh, I did some uh, first aid training over there, as you can see. And uh, yeah, I got the chance to see a lot of permafrost landscapes uh, and walk in the tundra. I went there and helped uh, colleagues um, oh, colleagues uh, set up their experiments, uh, walked in the tundra for a while. So yeah, it was a very great uh, experience. And yeah, uh, thanks for listening to this, call, this um, presentation. If you have any question now, uh, please free, feel free to ask. And if you have questions later and you think about it later, uh, I've left my email down here. So please feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to have a discussion with you. Thank you, Charles. This was such a great presentation uh, and a uh, very interesting project. Thank you so much. Thanks. I like the Tales of Master like project. Yeah, uh, I feel like oftentimes we hear a lot about the science, but uh, less so about maybe the human uh, part of it. Like, uh, yes. yeah. So yes. I felt like it was important to mention all of this. Um, it was a great experience. It's all, I mean, it's, it's almost done. It's not done yet. But uh, yeah, I've been, I'm very grateful for all the opportunities I had, uh, either, like I said, through this network or uh, some other opportunities. Sure. So if anyone has question, please just unmute and yeah, or you can uh, also use the chat box to ask the question. I really like uh, that you kind of uh, get us this overview of the Bayesian analysis. And uh, uh, I'm not very familiar with the old topic, but uh, I learned a lot today from your presentation. Thanks. And yeah, that is nice. Yeah, it can be uh, intimidating. I feel like the, sometimes when you hear names of methods and it seems complicated, but really when you boil it down, it's, it's very intuitive. Yeah. So maybe I can ask a question. But sure. It, it should be very basic. So uh, I wanted to know, like, uh, when did you came up with the prior distribution of your parameters? Was mm -hmm. it, uh, let, let's say based on the data which was already available or no, you just assumed some distribution, some like mean values? Yeah, so the way we constructed it, the prior distribution, uh, we had default values. So the, the parameters that I used in my optimization were already in the model. So they were already used. Uh, and so what we did since for the sensitivity analysis, we used a plus or minus 20% range to sort of explore within this. Uh, what we did for the optimization is we assumed a uniform distribution um, across this 20% range. And so meaning that we tell the algorithm there's a uh, the same chance uh, that the parameter is contained with the, within this range. And mm -hmm. it's a very, uh, let's say, well, it's, it's an approach that that way you ensure that you're not uh, sc screwing your optimization in one way. And um, it's also something that uh, when we looked at other research using optimization, so it's also something that seemed to be sort of like the way to go uh, using this uniform distribution. 
And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, that's how we came up with it. It's a good question. Thanks. Yeah, I uh, I could say like the you know, like the distribution were kind of all over the place in the like posterior distribution were yeah. kind of very different from those uh, prior ones. And I think this is the whole idea of like like Bayesian analysis and doing that optimization. Yeah, uh, it's very a show also of equifinality, I think, uh, which is a very hard problem when you have complex models and uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of things that are going on and it's I think it's difficult to optimize. And uh, maybe something I didn't talk about is how could we improve it? Uh, we could, you know, maybe like I mentioned, increase the range, uh, but mm -hmm. other than that, we could also maybe use other types of data sets, uh, for example, isotopic uh, carbon measurements, uh, which, so that way we, we would have, you know, the bulk carbon content, we would have the flux, but we would also have with this isotopic data, uh, it would be able to constrain like the residency time. So how much time does your carbon stays in the soil before it gets uh, respired out? And so maybe adding some other types of data could constrain it better. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. And like, uh, if uh, there is no question, maybe I can ask one more question. Sure. And uh, uh, so you like you had three sites with with a range of like uh, uh, criteria characteristics. Yeah. And I wanted. So now, let's say if you were adding more sites in this range, for example, you were taking into account a site in discontinuous permafrost zone, one in sporadic permafrost zone. Uh, how, like, uh, how would you expect the like the those uh, influential parameter to change? Mm -hmm. So, would you <clears throat> expect like uh, a great like uh, let's say? Uh, Lots of change or no, like you would say yeah, it would yeah. remain the same as like a continuous permafrost. Ideally, uh, we would have done the sensitivity analysis uh, globally. So that is simulating everywhere. Uh, but mm -hmm. when you do an analysis like that, you need to run the model multiple times, actually something like 150,000 times, uh, which would have taken a lot of time. So yeah, maybe adding some other sites, um, would have changed the order. Uh, let me just go back to it. Um, but I think that the goal uh, for the sensitivity analysis was to identify parameters like this one here, uh, mm -hmm. which didn't um, yeah, contribute at all. And so adding more sites, uh, say like you mentioned, uh, some permafrost night sites that are not in continuous uh, permafrost zone, it might have made it so that uh, parameters like this uh, DB here, which is turbation, might have been more important. But um, yeah, but the, the goal was to really have uh, oh. sites where the parameters would be used. And so if you have a site that is only permafrost so for this one, and you also have one that it's uh, non-continuous, well, your parameter is going to still be used. So what you'll see maybe is a uh, less sensitivity, but it's still going to be up there instead of being down with the others. And so I don't think it would have changed uh, which parameter we remove from the optimization. It mm -hmm. might change uh, what parameters we put in what scenarios, uh, because we removed the parameters that never were sensitive, but then we sort of did uh, an increasing uh, increasing the number. So we we kept all parameters that showed sensitivity. And even those ones that you can see in the insert that are uh, lower, we kept in it uh, through the, the four different scenarios. I don't know if that was clear, but. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. sure. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone to stopping by. I know you all have uh, busy days, so it's appreciated. <laughs>